Welcome back to the story of liberty. This is John Bona. Without a doubt, the most important message of all time is the gospel of Christ the Lord. There is no other name on earth or beneath the earth or in the heavens by which a person can be saved and go to heaven except through the name, the person of Jesus Christ. We often hear people say that he was a great man or a great teacher or a prophet, but really nothing more. I remember talking to a friend of mine who was a lifeguard many years ago, and we had a discussion about who is Jesus Christ. And his answer was that he was a good man. He was a teacher. He was a good guy that was tortured and killed by mistake. Not long after that conversation, the friend died. We did have an opportunity to tell him who Jesus really was, that he was the only begotten Son of God. I hope he believed and is now in heaven. Let's take a brief look, a little closer look, at who Jesus Christ really is. Let me say, first of all, that nobody possesses the qualifications to expound the full character, the greatness of God. In fact, the Bible tells us that we cannot do that. I think we could spend the rest of our lives and even in eternity trying to comprehend who is God. First, let's take a look at what his Father says, God the Father. When Jesus was beginning his ministry, he was being baptized by John at the Jordan River, right there in the book of Matthew. Remember that the dove, the symbol of the Holy Spirit, descended and a voice from heaven was heard saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. God calls Jesus his son, not one of my sons, or this is a son of God. Scripture says it very clear, this is my beloved son. We know that in the great famous verse of all scripture, John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, the coming of Christ into the world and the advent, the beginning of the Christian faith is the greatest benefit in the history of mankind. The coming of Christ to the world actually defines time. Before he came, all time is dated B.C. After he came, it's all A.D. All the world is forever different, forever changed for the good, because he is the universal attraction. The entire history of mankind before his coming was really, in a sense, an awaiting of his great advent into the world. The people were waiting for the Messiah. All history since his coming has been the progression of his spirit in the hearts and minds of men and women, and the establishment of his kingdom on earth. There could be no argument about the fact that Jesus is the one person in human history of whom more has been 
written upon and spoken of than any other person ever. Just think about if all the books, all the tracts, all the pamphlets, all the newspapers printed over the last 1500 years since the beginning of the printing press about Christ, his incarnation, his pre-existence, his ascension, his teachings, his virtue, his miracles, his death, his suffering, his resurrection. If they were gathered into one place, all of those writing, where is the building big enough that can hold it? And then what about the countless millions of sermons that have been preached on the uniqueness, the grace, the power of God? What about the unnumbered hosts of Christian workers, evangelists, pastors, priests, Christian workers who every Sunday when it comes around magnify him, preach his gospel, his Lord and Savior, wherever they witness to other people about him on planet Earth. Even the name of Jesus is placed side by side equally with God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Jesus is set forth in the midst of his peers, on the one hand the Father Almighty, and on the other, the Holy Spirit. His friends in his childhood, they knew him as Jesus, the name which he was known in his hometown there in Nazareth, in Jerusalem and Galilee. He was Jesus of Nazareth, or said in Hebrew, he was Yahshua. Remember when the angel proclaimed Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Isn't that amazing in itself? That his name means Jehovah saves. God saves. Christ was also fully human in every way. We know he was born of the Virgin Mary. He was the seed of David. He was even the descendant of Adam, we're told by Luke. He had brothers and sisters, according to the Gospel. He had a human ancestry, at least on his mother's side. He also had a human appearance. There was nothing about him that caused anyone to think he was anything different than a man. See, the veil that God had wore shut out more glory than we could bear. He was taken as a man by his friends, his disciples, and even his enemies. They said, is this not the carpenter's son? He claimed to be a man, even the son of man, and he dwelt here about 33 years and he will return one day to have dominion over the earth. He experienced all those things that we experience. He hungered, he thirsted, he wept, he slept. He was weary some days. He was tempted in all the ways we are, yet without sin. He suffered and then he finally died. He was the very human Jesus, but he was also the very perfect Christ the Lord. He had our human nature in all ways, yet without one single sin. The Christ is the only perfect man the world has ever known. Apart from him, all have sinned. He sat 
Which of you convinceth me of sin? He also said that the prince of the world comes and has nothing in me. See, there was nothing about him that the devil could appeal or use. In fact, that is the great confession of the Christian church, that Jesus, the Son of God, has come to earth in the flesh. What did Jesus say about himself? Well, he said many things. Here's a few of them. He knew who he was, where he came from, why he entered the world, and what the future held for him. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. He further said after his resurrection, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Just think about that statement. All the power in heaven and earth has been given to Christ the Lord. Christ is omnipotent. He's the God who will judge all earth. He declared that all judgment was given to the Son, that he may be equal with the Father. He is the judge of the entire world of all time. And further, he raises the dead. He gives life to whosoever he will. Jesus is the Father's confidence. And from him, the other children of God obtain their knowledge of the Father. Jesus, by his sacrificial death, made his own receive the greatest blessing of all time. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. He perfectly fulfilled the Father's will, and he has all authority. And he told us very plainly, very clearly, that heaven and earth would pass away but that his words would never pass away. These statements are perfectly true because Jesus lived before he was born. His beginning as the word was long before his beginning as a man. In three crisp sentences, announces the way in which Jesus existed in the beginning before all things. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Isaiah said, He was the high and the lofty one that inhabited eternity, whose name is Holy, His coming to earth out of the past unmeasured eternity is clearly made in his claim, before Abraham was, I am. Remember the woman in Samaria that would talk with Jesus? She said, I know the Messiah will come, which is called Christ. When he is to come, he will tell us all things. Jesus responded to her, I that speak to you am he. How much clearer could that possibly be? The one who was the Messiah, the one who is omnipotent, the one who is the judge of all the earth, the one who is the one who gives life and raises the dead, the one who is eternal, could say, Verily I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. When Jesus urged his disciples to search the Old Testament books, he said, they testify of me. He actually identified himself with Daniel's prophecy of Messiah the Prince, who would come and vindicate his claim as God's anointed one. Jesus uses the same name that God chose for himself and revealed to Moses at the burning bush. Who shall I say has sent me? 
asked Moses. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Thou shalt say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. When Jesus was confronted in the garden by the soldiers of the high priest and the Romans, we read in scripture, Jesus said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. In the English it says, I am he, but in the Greek it says, I am. There was so much power in those words that the Roman soldiers all fell backwards and fell to the ground. No man could have taken Christ had he not allowed to be taken. He offered himself. Jesus came when everything was the darkest and most grim on planet Earth. No one in the history of the world can be compared to him, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No matter how many times you'll admire some individual throughout history, inevitably you will find the feet of clay because all humans have fallen short. They have their weaknesses. They have their character faults. And that's all of us. But Jesus is the altogether perfect and lovely one. Which of the other religious leaders, Muhammad or Buddha, for example, died for the sins of their people? Which of them rose from the dead? Which has even followers who make such a claim? There is none. Jesus is altogether different from every one of them. Did you notice in scripture that Jesus never changes a word that he said? He never says, oh, I didn't mean that, I meant this. Who could say that? Nobody. He never apologized for anything. Who can make that claim? There was never a misstatement. There was never a half-truth because he was truth itself. He was the incarnated truth. There was never an action. There was never any word that he modified to the slightest degree. Jesus was the perfect balance of truth and love and mercy and justice. Did you notice that Jesus never asked for advice from anyone? Even Moses, the great lawgiver, had counselors. Solomon, the wisest of men, he sought advice. He sought counsel. But Jesus didn't need any. He never went to school. What he received was from the Father, and he gave it to us. Jesus was the incarnated wisdom. Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Well, people were always asking, what kind of person was Christ? This was the question they kept asking. What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, we could say that he was what he said. There was no disconnect ever between the teaching of Christ and his life, what he actually did. Now, frankly, there's a disconnect in all of us in practicing what we preach. And every person in the world who has ever taught the moral code, we all fall short to some degree of that. One skeptic said Jesus fully carried out his perfect doctrine in life and conduct. He was his own credential. Yes, Christ the Lord was his own credential. He had no college degree, no plaque hanging on the wall to show how great he was. He did what he taught, and he taught the highest morality the world has ever known culminating at the statement toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Well, have any of us done that? Have any of us been perfect? No, I don't think so. 
but he was the altogether perfect Christ. He always did those things that pleased his Father. You know, it's interesting that even his enemies could not say anything against him. Judas, who betrayed him, said, I have betrayed innocent blood. Pilate, who condemned him, said, I find no fault in this man. The centurion that pounded spikes into his hands and feet said, Certainly this was a righteous man. Truly this was the Son of God. The thief that died in agony next to him said, We've received our due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. The entire world has joined in chorus to say, Jesus is the moral paragon. Notice that Jesus never asked anyone to pray for him. Remember the night before in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was sweating blood. He knew what was coming. But he gathered together his apostles, his friends, and he asked them to pray. But notice what he says. Watch and pray for yourselves that you enter not into temptation. Why did he not permit or ask anyone to pray for him like all of us would do? The answer is very obvious. He doesn't need prayers. He doesn't want prayers. Why? Because Jesus of Nazareth is God Almighty in human form. There on the Via Della Rosa on the very day of his death, after being beaten and scourged and unjustly condemned to die, he dragged that cross out to the hill of Calvary. And followed by the weeping woman of Jerusalem, he stopped and turned and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? He is God. He does not need our prayers or our concern. Jesus did come, God Almighty. If he didn't, our world would be sunk into total skepticism and unbelief by now. Religion itself would be totally degenerated. Men would live a hopeless life. There'd be no future, no heaven, no judgment to come. Man would be returned to the jungle and it would be everyone against his neighbor. But the idea of brotherhood, of being compassionate, love, self-sacrifice would have become the law of the jungle. But he did come. Thank God he came and he died for us. Death is an appointment that every one of us must keep. It is appointed unto men once to die. Jesus knew of his coming death. He constantly predicted it. He knew the manner and the purpose of it. It would take hours to explain all the things he said about that, but here's just a few. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He spoke about the temple of his body. The sign, the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The Son of Man must be lifted up. The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and in the third day he shall be raised again. He knew the exact moment of his departure from planet Earth. And when he did die, he didn't die as a martyr. He didn't die as a victim. He died as the most victorious death of all time. And he cried with a loud voice, It is finished. Christ did come, and he brought life and immortality and he freely offers that gift of everlasting life in his paradise to all who will simply trust in him he did come and the world is all different 
But the big question is, has he come to you? Has he come into your heart to dispel the darkness of doubt, the darkness of hopelessness? Do you know that you'll be with him forever in his heaven? Do you know that the grave is not the end? Do you know that death itself has lost its sting? And when your time does come, my prayer is that that moment you will not really die, as Christ said. You will simply pass through that invisible portal Whatever that is, we don't know. And that you will be immediately with Christ. Because he said, those that believe in him will never die. Your body may stop functioning. Your heart may stop beating. But your soul will continue forever with Christ the Lord for eternity. And think of that a moment. Eternity. With Christ in his heaven. Eternity is eons and eons of time. Hundreds of billions of years. And then it's just beginning. The fullest revelation of who God is, is made in the person of Christ. No man has seen the Father at any time, the only begotten Son, which is the bosom of the Father. He has declared him. As I said, it's our desire to reveal some part, to show some part of the glory of Christ as revealed in Scripture as the object of our faith, our love, our admiration, our adoration. But even after our utmost endeavor, our diligent inquiry, we have to say how little a portion of him we understand. His glory is incomprehensible. His praises unutterable. So it was declared I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself. The Word becoming flesh, who being in the form of God, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. That's in Hebrews 1.3. The Word was God. And Christ thought it not robbery to be equal with God. We enter with fear and trembling upon this high and holy subject Christ's name is called Wonderful, Counselor, and even the angels of God are commanded to worship him. There is no salvation apart from a true knowledge of him, because whosoever denies the Son, either his true Godhead or his true holy humanity, has not the Father. Without a great controversy, the great mystery of his godliness is unfolded. God was manifest in the flesh. He cannot be fully comprehended by any finite intelligence here on planet Earth. No man knows the Son but the Father. Nevertheless, it is our privilege to grow in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The one born in that Bethlehem manger was the mighty God, Emmanuel, the great God and the Savior, 
He is also the true man with the spirit, a soul, and a body. For these are essential to his human nature. Two separate natures are united into one peerless person. The Theantropos, the God-man. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Yet this is a surprising conjunction that the Holy Writ itself sets before us that the Most High abased himself, the Lord of glory, assumed the form of a man. The King of Kings became a subject. Nothing endears the Redeemer more to the hearts than the realization that it was for our sakes he became poor and abased himself. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing is our united testimony. He was despised and rejected by men. The prophecy of Isaiah was in the hands of the Jews for 700 years before Jesus was born in that Bethlehem manger. Yet so exactly did it predict and describe what would befall him that it might have been written by one of the apostles. The prophecy of Isaiah was in the hands of the Jews 700 years before Jesus was born at Bethlehem. Yet so exactly did it predict and describe what would befall him. Think about it. Who would know what would happen to somebody 700 years from now? We would know nothing about that person to describe him, what he's like, what he would do. Yet here Isaiah describes in great detail Christ the Lord, 700 years before his birth. But the appearance of Christ in God's timing fully exposes man. And it brings to light because he is the light of the world, as nothing else. But how desperate mankind was, the wickedness of man's heart. That's why Christ came. Why was Christ rejected by men? Well, a number of reasons. He required purity. Second, he was demanding repentance and man did not want to repent. Third, he insisted on a denial of self. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He came to set the captives free. They beheld the most amazing event. What man had seen, the most awe-inspiring spectacle men ever saw the most tragic and yet most glorious deed ever performed. They beheld God incarnate, taken by wicked hands and slain. At the same time, the Redeemer voluntarily laying his life down for others. No one took Christ's life. He laid it down voluntarily. Christ is referred to as a righteous servant, a righteous branch, the Lord of our righteousness, the Son of righteousness, a righteous man, the righteous judge. He is our advocate with the Father. Remember Pilate's wife sent a warning to her husband? Don't have anything to do with this righteous man. In that same chapter, Pilate himself declared, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. God had made Christ to be sin for us. Our sin was imputed to him, who knew no sin, that we might 
be made right before God. Here is the double imputation of our sins to Christ and his righteousness back to us. The great transaction. Well, the saints of God are bidden to make our calling and election sure. We are assured that if we do this, we shall never fall. God's people are exhorted to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here again, God's order is the opposite of man. In other words, those who have not submitted to Christ as Lord, but say they trust in him as Savior, are deceived. See, there is a very real difference between believing in the deity of Christ and surrendering to his lordship. Many are firmly persuaded that Jesus is the Son of God, and they have no doubt that he is the maker of heaven and earth. But that, my friends, is no proof of conversion. The demons knew him as the Son of God. We must surrender ourselves to him. He became the author of our eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. The backslidden church at Ephesus was told, repent and do the first works. As a friend of mine once said to me, I just dropped by to tell you that Christ is Lord. He is Lord, all power in heaven and earth is his. Therefore, he is the master of every situation. He's sufficient for every emergency, able to supply every need. When a Christian trembles in the presence of his enemies, it is because he doubts or has lost sight the faithfulness and the power of Christ. But sanctify in your hearts Christ as Lord. Christ is the best friend the Christian has. And it's both a privilege and a duty to regard him as a friend. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That is our beloved Christ the Lord, that is my friend. I hope he is yours too. Christ is our ancient friend. Old friends are prized highly. We think of old friends with good thoughts. But he's a constant friend. He loves us at all times. He's a faithful friend. He's a powerful friend and he's willing and able to help us. He's a everlasting friend. He will never desert us in the hour of crisis. He will never leave us or forsake us. He has declared that he is the Son of God who has been made the heir of all things, that he is the brightness of the Father's glory in the express image of his person. Just think of the demonstration that was made of his immeasurable superiority to the angels even. Yet so infinite was his condensation. Yet so great was his love to those given him by the Father that he took a place lower than that was occupied by the celestial creatures. Whatever your circumstances, the Savior is all sufficient. El Shaddai. He knew what it was to be weary, to be exhausted. He knew what it was to suffer and hunger and thirst. If you're homeless out there, He had not a place to lay his head either. Are you grieving? Because he was the man of sorrows. 
Are you misunderstood or criticized by fellow believers? So was he by his own disciples. Whatever your lot on this planet, he can fully enter into it. He experienced all the miseries of mankind and he has not forgotten them. Let us remember that when the child is most ill, that the mother comes and sits beside that child. And Christ said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So coming to Christ denotes turning our backs upon the world and turning our hearts to him. He's our only hope. It means abandoning every idol, including that new car you may have bought, and surrender ourselves to his lordship. It is repudiating our own righteousness and our hearts going out to him in loving submission and trusting in him. It's casting ourselves upon his mercy in yielding ourselves to his authority to be ruled by him and to follow where Christ leads. It is our whole being, our soul, our heart, our mind turning to Christ and trusting in him and be prepared to trust and love and devotely serve him. This is a spiritual rest, a rest for the soul. It is such a rest that the world can never give it or take it away. There'll be a rest from the dominion and power of sin if we do this. There's a rest from our own works. Of course, in heaven, there'll be absolute rest for eternity. Take my yoke upon you, surrendering to his lordship, to his rule. Let's take a look at the circumstances of the crucifixion of Christ. The religious leaders of Israel had taken the initiative and they assembled together the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people into the palace of the high priest, who was Caiaphas. And they consulted together that they might take Jesus and kill him. And when Pilate reasoned with the people, all the people said, his blood be on us and on our children. Second, look where this took place. It was on the outskirts of Jerusalem, a city more popular, more known than Rome or London or even New York today. It was the residence of David, the seat of the kings of Israel. It was in this city that Christ taught and wrought miracles. It was into this city that he had ridden a few days earlier, seated upon a donkey, as the multitudes cried, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Next, think of the significance, the historical accuracy of this crucifixion. Christ was crucified the beginning of April. It was the first of Israel's great national feasts. It was the most important season in the Jewish year. It was the Passover. This solemn celebration of that night when all the firstborn sons of the Hebrews were spared from death from the angel of death in the land of Egypt. 
Thus, huge crowds had traveled from all parts of the land. It was no obscure corner, nor in secret, that the great sacrifice of all time was offered to God. And it was the appointed day for the Lord Jesus as the Lamb of God. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. No other day could he be slain. And what did they see? The most amazing event in human history. The most awe-inspiring spectacle man had ever saw. They sat down to watch him. But when they were no longer able to do so, at midday suddenly it became midnight. About the sixth hour after sunrise, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. It was though as the sun had refused to shine, and nature itself mourned over such a sight. During those three hours, a great transaction took place. As soon as the Savior committed his spirit into the hands of the Father, behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. The earth quaked, the rocks rent, and the graves were open. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose. With regard to another of the miracles at Calvary, the miracle of amazing grace took place. God even was pleased to soften the hearts of these Roman soldiers who pounded nails into Christ's hands and feet. When the centurion was watching, watching Jesus, he saw the earthquake and those things that were done. They feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And so we see another of the great miracles of Calvary, the miracle of amazing grace. And we might expect to meet in heaven the man who hammered the nails into the Savior's hands and thrust the spear into his side. God's answer to Christ's prayer, Father, forgive them. So there is hope for the vilest sinner. We will simply surrender to the Lordship of Christ and trust in his blood. There God laid on him the inequity of us all, and his holy wrath was poured out upon Christ, because God is of pure eyes and to behold evil, and cannot look upon inequity. Therefore he turned his back on the sin-bearer, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We see God's inflexible justice. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. There's no deviation from that. He will by no means clear the guilty. But he did not even make an exception if the one who testifies as the Lamb of God, without blemish and without spot, for Christ was sinless in both nature and action, but because of the sins of his people had been laid upon him, God spared not his own son. Because our sin was transferred to him, the great transaction, punishment was vested upon him. Therefore God cried, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, says the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd. God would not abate one iota of his righteous demand. He is no respecter of persons. And how fully was that demonstrated at Calvary. God would not exempt the person of his beloved, his only begotten son, the one in whom his soul delights, he occupied the place of our guilt. 
we see the amazing grace of God. God gave his love toward us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. We see God's manifold wisdom. His word declares, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination. But at the cross, divine perfections unite the blending of the colors like the rainbow. There, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. God's justice was satisfied by Christ, and therefore his mercy flows freely to all who will repent and believe. The wisdom of God appears in creation and providence, but nowhere so grandly as at Calvary. Christ took our place at the cross, and our trust and faith in him appropriates that fact. In the person of my substitute, Christ the Lord, we satisfy every requirement of God's law. In the person of Christ, we pay the full price which divine justice demanded. In the person of Christ, I stand approved before God, and we are clothed in his righteousness. The whole church, his bride, can say together, he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our inequities who in his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. And our faith in him declares, I am crucified with Christ, who loved me, who gave himself for me. Hallelujah, what a savior. Well, it's rather clear, isn't it, that if you're not a friend of Christ, you're his enemy. There is no third class. He that is not with me is against me. And from that, there is no appeal. If you've despised his authority, flaunted his laws, treated his claims with contempt, you reject his yoke and scepter and refuse to be ruled by him. And thus, those will unite and be casted out by him. But if you surrender to his lordship and trust in his redeeming blood, he will accept you now. Him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. So if we come to him as a repentant sinner, a spiritual pauper, and cast ourselves upon his grace, he will pardon our inequities and give you a royal welcome. Come unto me all that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. But let me leave you with a stern warning. If you continue to turn your back upon him, one day he will say to you, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels.